Coming up, I'm blown away by a pile of twigs. This is by far the most elaborate bower. A lizard grabs its lunch. Whoa. Do you see his tongue? And a snake in the grass plays hard Ooh. to get. He's quick. Come here, matey. We've got a family of birds here in Australia that are like no other. There are eight species found right throughout a range of environments. They're described as artists, sculptors and painters, and I'd have to agree. They're terms that only apply to males, though, as it's his job to build a stage on which to attract the female of the species. Do you hear that? That's a tooth-billed bowerbird. He's the only bowerbird in Australia that doesn't build a structure. That's not to say he doesn't put the effort in. I'm pretty happy that I found one. I don't know anyone personally that's stumbled across one. They're hard to find because there's not a bower. There's no blue decorations or pieces of glass or bone or other things that would give away bowerbird bowers. Let's go and have a closer look. The toothbill is unique. He clears a patch of forest floor and using notches in his bill, he nips off leaves to lay on his bower always displaying them upside down. Now, it's a primitive type display site for a female. The male will have a perch and he calls like that. He waits for a female and when she comes, he'll drop to the ground and do a dance. It's at the other end of the scale compared to the Western Bowerbird's Bower. He goes to great lengths selecting twigs to build his avenue and stage in order to lay out his prized possessions. But the tooth build is like no other. He isn't one for artificial ornaments. It's au natural all the way for this fella. Now the forest floor is littered with leaves and debris, but his site is immaculately clean. He removes everything, every stick, leaf, rock, and it's back down to bare earth, and that's his display site. And what's it all for? Well, males have only one purpose in life, to attract females and sire young. And the owner here has competition. In fact, I can hear two other males in close proximity. Looking at the state of this one, it's obviously owned by a younger bird, one that's still learning. You can tell that by the general state of the bower. He hasn't even cleaned the forest floor. The other one is definitely a threat. Not as well kept as the one I'm looking at, but he's keeping the dominant male of the area on his toes. Time to hop out and let our boy here get down to business. He sits on a perch near his bower from October to March in the hope of enticing a passing female. And look at that, our boy's in luck. A female's landed right near the display site. See him there behind that tree? He doesn't want her to see him just yet. He wants her to inspect the display site. It won't be long before he's doing his dance. There he goes. This is where he really needs to impress. Look at him dancing hopping and lunging about his stage. There goes his wings, spread wide. If she's impressed, it won't be long before they mate. Now that was truly something else. A rare sight indeed. The next generation of tooth-billed bowers is on the way. I've been having a great time showing my eldest son, Bill, what it takes to be a park keeper. We've been doing all sorts. Chopping food. Whoa, whoa, whoa that was a good one. Releasing a snake. He likes it. Wow. And howling at dingoes. Oh. But right now, we've got some koala yards to rake. All right, I'm jumping in, mate. You climb up. Come on. Ah. Just... Look at what we've got here. These are two of Billy's favourites. This is me. She's an eight-year-old great mum. She's had a number of joeys, but this is little Max. Does She's... he play one home? Oh, I don't think so. Not a koala. They climb up the curtains. And little Maxie on the back there, at this size, he's way too big for the pouch. And when they first emerge from the pouch, they'll sit in Mum's belly, right in there where it's warm. But at this size, he just hitches a ride. Everywhere Mum goes, he goes. 
up. Look how much he's holding on there. Koalas are having a bit of a hard time in the wild. There's dog attacks, hit by cars, urban sprawl. This means their habitat is disappearing. And to top it all off, they've got a retrovirus which causes all types of immune-related diseases. Numbers have dropped dramatically, particularly in Queensland and northern New South Wales. It's a worrying trend. All right, that's good, mate. We're going to rake the koalas? All right. Koalas need a lot of husbandry, a lot of maintenance. Not only do they need fresh eucalyptus every day, but they need to have their sand rake, their water changed, and we're going to put some fresh leaves in now. Two, three. There you go. You good? OK, I'm coming. All right. Good job, mate. No one likes a lot of poo around their yard, like and koalas are no different. What do you got? Ko koala poo. Yeah. It never fails to amuse me why kids are so fascinated by poo, and little Bill's no different. All right, you hold the bucket for me, pal. I'm going to break it in there. There's more poo. Yeah, there's lots of poo. Come on, put the bucket down right next to it. All right, all right, I got it, I got it. Once the yard's clean, it's time for a feed. What do koalas eat? Leaves. What sort of leaves? Gum leaves. They do. Let's put some in. Everybody knows koalas eat gum leaves, but there's around 2,000 different species of eucalyptus in Australia, maybe 30 of which we can feed to the koalas within our region. And people think koalas get drunk from the gum leaves they eat, but that's not the case. It's just that it's really low in its nutritional qualities. So koalas need to sleep so much to conserve energy. They sleep up to 18 to 20 hours a day. Even koalas have basic camouflage. Now, this koala up there, if you look up at him, you see blotchy white. Now, if I was a dingo on the ground and I look up, I see a koala's bottom that's white and blends in with the clouds. Or if there was an eagle above, which is another of the koala's predators, looking down, I would see a grey and brown back, and that blends in with the trees. Pretty clever. You gonna put that bit in? One more branch to go, and it's Bill's honour. Hey, that's good, mate. I want to put that on me. OK, there you go. Put it in. Dad, Just... how would I eat it? Well, when it's night time, they're going to wake up and come down and they're going to eat all these fresh leaves off the end. I hey, guess what we're going to do now? What? We're going to play with some reptiles. A little crocodile? Yeah, a little crocodile. Let's go. There's nothing better than setting a challenge when you're out looking for wildlife. This is Tasmania, and I'm on a mission to find its three snake species, which all just happen to be venomous. Just like the rest of Australia, stumbling across a snake whilst trekking through the bush is pretty common. Been looking for a copperhead snake, and there's one right there, a big boy. Now, there's a dam down there where there'd be heaps of frogs, and that's why he's here now. Copperheads rank about number 16 for their strongest venom. They're hard to hold because they're really whippy. He's off. Come here, matey. Come here, mate. He's quick. Whoa. Come on, mate. They're fiery little snakes, copperheads. He is. Oh, there we go. That is a big copperhead. That's a lowland copperhead. Now, copperheads are big frog eaters. Little ones will eat skinks. I wouldn't want to get bitten by one. Look at that now, how he's flattening out. That's just showing me he's trying to make himself look big. They're beautiful snakes. Now, Tasmania's cold. It's a very cold climate. You don't find pythons down here. Now, the copperhead is almost pitch black, and that's so that he can absorb so much more of the sun's heat. They can actually be found sunbaking on snow. Pretty extreme, but it happens. They're able to function at really low temperatures. But in general, it means they're only really active in the warmer months and can go the entire winter without food. Easy, mate. Now, I don't really like holding copperheads because they're a short-bodied, a stocky snake. They're able to whip up and they're known to have a bit of fire, a bit of character, a bit of attitude. All right, now I'm going to leave him and let him on his way. Thanks for letting us have a look, mate. What a great snake to catch. 
Just a brilliant snake. So I'm going to let him go back that way. One down, two to go. But the day is still young. I'm in Queensland on the hunt for bower birds. I've already come across the amazing tooth-billed bower, but now I'm after something a whole lot more colourful. Jesus. The northeastern corner of Australia harbours the country's greatest diversity of plant and animal species, many of which are found nowhere else in the world. For those reasons, it was recognised by the United Nations and is known as the Wet Tropics World Heritage Area. It's home to countless rare and threatened species and attracts visitors from all over the world. It's hardly a surprise when, if you're lucky, you get to see something like the golden bowerbird. This is by far the most elaborate bower of any bowerbird in Australia. This is more typical of what you'd see in New Guinean bowerbirds. Though it's the smallest of all bowerbirds, the golden bower builds the largest of all Australian bowers. After finding a suitable site, usually a tree trunk and a sapling, he erects two towers connected by a display perch. These towers are called maypoles. Every part of this bower has a purpose. Every stick is placed in an exact spot. And not just any stick will do. Every single one is chosen for the particular way that it looks. He'll often go for whitish or pale green flowers like orchids and jasmine, but he collects seed pods and lichens as well. Now, the general rule with bowerbirds is the more attractive the male bowerbird, the less attractive the bower, the less work goes into that bower. But the golden bowerbird is a bit of an exception. It is itself stunning, and its bower is the most elaborate of any of the Australian bowerbirds. Now all we need is the owner of this bower to return, so I can back up my claim of how good looking he is. He's there right now. That's just amazing. Look how delicately he places his jewels. All to attract a female. If another bower has a rarer ornament, she'll go there, so making sure his bower is the prettiest is paramount. And that's what this is all about, males being able to pass on their genes. I don't think there's another animal on the planet that goes to such lengths to attract the opposite sex. Apart from one, of course. I've been known to give my house a tidy from time to time to impress my wife. But the bowerbirds are absolutely unique in the wild. This is truly magical. His work is never ending and you know, he stores fruit at his bower. He can eat there and not leave the bower for extended periods of time. I'd never imagined in my wildest dreams I'd sit here and watch golden bowerbird decorate his bower. It's one of the truly amazing things that you would ever see in the bird world. My boy Bill's first day working with his dad is near its end. We've had a great time, but there's still some reptiles to see. Have a look up this one. Now. We've got over 500 animals at the park, and it's fair to say I think Bill's blown away by the reptiles. Look! What is it? Well, his dad is the general manager of a reptile park. I Look guess I've taught him well. That's it. What's in there? Do you know what they are? What are they? That's a land mullet, that's a skink, and that's a dragon. Hey, look! I missed one! Oh, another, another one. I did miss him. Come on, monkey. Hi, hey, girls, how you going? Good. High five. Come on. Don't leave me hanging. Give them fives. You don't need to get nervous around the girls. <laughs> ah, look at you. Make one, mate. All right, mate. What you how you going, mate? Good. Sure. No, you're all right, mate. Come on. Here we go. Most of the animals here at the reptile park are on display for visitors to see. But we do have some areas off display and they're filled with animals that are used for education to teach people to visit the park. Come on, Bill. Come and have a look at this one. Look at this. What is it? That's a chameleon. Here you go. 
Yeah. That's it. Hold it. Whoa! Did you see his tongue? What did he do? He licked it up. That's what he does. He's got a sticky tongue and he shoots it out. The veiled chameleons are found in the Middle East and they are very cool lizards. Firstly, they can change colour. And really, they wear their hearts on their sleeve. If they're dark, they're upset. If they're light, they're happy. Now, they also have eyes that can rotate all directions within their sockets and they're able to spot food whilst keeping an eye on maybe another rival male. Pretty impressive. There's a lot that happens behind the scenes that most people never get to see. He's a lucky boy, my Bill. He's your favourite, buddy. An alligator. Here we go. You remember how to do it? Here you go, you take him. You know how to do it up behind the head there, nice and soft, yeah. yep. And one on the tail. That's it, hold him. Good, strong boy, that's good. This is an American alligator, and they are very different than the Australian saltwater crocodile. These guys are puppies. Very calm, placid, and I'm really happy that he's handling something of this size. Alligators aren't native to Australia. They live in the swamps of the southeastern United States. Though it gets hot there, it's nothing like the heat we get here. So every summer, we have to rescue gator eggs from their nests so they don't overheat. That's a boy. Put the lid on. I reckon Bill's done real well today. I'm proud of him. A real zookeeper in the making. But his dad's got to get on with managing the park and his mum's waiting outside. All right, mate, mummy's outside with Maddie. Come on, Superman. I want chippies. You want some chippies? Sport. All right, well, you did do a pretty good effort today. You can have some chippies. What's that? That was a really good day. As a dad, I'm really proud of him, and I can tell he's had just as much fun as me. I'm on a mission in Tassie to find its three venomous snakes. I've just seen a little white lip snake, or the Tasmanian whip snake. And I saw him just dart off the path here, and he hasn't come out from this spot. So I'm just going to gently flip this log. There he is. Come here, mate. Put that log back down. Look at that. They're skink eaters. They're skink specialists. And like all snakes, their tongue's forked and brilliant sense of smell. So as they go along, they flick that tongue out and actually taste the air. And that tells them which direction the skink is, how long ago it was there, and if it's the type they like to eat. You can see where they get their name because of that white lip. And this is full grown. They don't get much bigger at all. And they're quite dark. They're diurnal, means they're out through the daytime when their prey's out, skinks. And although they don't look so camouflaged, they are, that colour just blends in beautifully with this forest floor. And we always imagine that snakes envenomate their prey just to kill the prey, but that's not always the case. With some of these rear fang snakes, they actually inject venom to help with digestion. Snakes like this run a risk when they swallow their food whole. They risk that the skink, the food, might actually go rotten inside the belly before it's digested. So by injecting it with venom as it's being swallowed, it begins to break the skink down from the inside out. That, with the belly juices, the belly acids, makes sure the food doesn't rot. Okay, right back where I found him. Just one more on the list of Tasmanian snakes to tick off. All this needs is a keen eye and a bit of luck. This is a Tassie tiger snake. I've been looking for a while, I've finally found one. And they come in a whole range of colours. This one's pretty dark, a slaty grey. And this is the fourth most toxic snake in the world. Well, it has the fourth strongest venom of any snake. That's pretty impressive. Certainly en enough in there to kill a few grown men. Now, they're dark in Tassie because it's cold down here. It's a very cool climate, and they need to be dark to absorb the sun's heat when it's out. Where are you going there, mate? Tiger snakes got to be one of my favourite snakes. In captivity, they're calm, they're quiet, but when they need to, they mean business. Big head, big venom glands, good fangs, good delivery system, and an incredibly strong venom to back it up. 
full of character and attitude. That's what makes them one of my favorites. Now, tiger snakes are opportunistic predators. They eat a lot of reptiles and amphibians, skinks and frogs. But they'll take baby birds, mammals, and that venom is incredibly strong. They have a strong anticoagulant. Now, basically, that thickens your blood, turns it to jelly, and you're likely to go into cardiac arrest. That, coupled with some powerful neurotoxins that are sending your body into paralysis, mean one bite, it's game over. All right, I'll let him go. There you go, matey. Thank you. That's it. Job done. A copperhead, a whippy, and a tiger snake. How awesome was that? Oh, my God.